Thompson.
There you go, and also an amateur host, it seems. <laughs> um, I'm delighted to say that Marshall, Farrell, and Claire Rastner. Um, as you know, tonight, uh, late, is celebrating Richard Bell, whose work Embassy is installed at the Turbine Hall Bridge and will be throughout summer. Richard's work is centred around um, Indigenous land rights, uh, our connections with the land, and the integral part that those connections play to our identity. Um, these are also themes that are explored by both Bell in their books Unearth and Uprooting, respectively. So I feel really lucky that they're both here to um, share with us how their evolving relationships with the land have impacted them both personally. Um, so firstly, thank you for being here and welcome. Um, both of your books explore the fundamental human need for a sense of place and home. Um, and in both the books, you explore your own personal search for a sense of belonging. They also both recognize the fundamental uh, truth that is our relationship to the land is, is profoundly political. Uh, so I thought it'd be nice to kick off with um, you guys reading a segment from each of your books that kind of reflects this, if that's right. Yeah, sure. Um, so my book, Uprooting, isn't actually published yet. It's out in August. Um, and this is a small segment from quite near the end, actually. I circle my autumn garden, thinking about cycles of hurt and trauma caused by imperialism. Walking around the plants dying as we near the end of the year, colonialism is dying all around me. The path through an English garden is a journey around the globe. Generations of plant hunters brought them here from other lands, just as they changed the landscape of my Caribbean home. Today's English gardens are colonial products, plants moving with people along the field lines of empire. Today's English landscape is a colonial product, stripped of its own indigenous creatures by the ind industrial land management practices that colonialism bred. Humans created the changing soil and climate conditions that allowed the plants brought by humans to thrive and become invasive. Every soil has been poisoned by colonial greed. I pause in front of one of the large pots we brought with us to the garden. We have not planted it out, not yet decided on the ideal spot. It feels important to get it right. The plant is in the final flush of flower, one last burst of heavily scented bloom before winter's death. It is a rose. The English rose, the beloved symbol of the idyllic English garden, a stone cottage front covered in the tumbling charm of a climbing rose, or the formal garden of a majestic country house, roses tied up in box hedging knots. This is the plant that most captures the English imagination, red roses against white in a century's past war, a pretty girl, an English rose, the only type of beautiful flower that I, Ayana, can never be. My grandmother's beloved flower, a representation of how thorny it can be to love. And yet for all the potent symbolism of the rose and England, it is not native here. It is an immigrant who has been loved and naturalized. Roses were originally cultivated for gardens thousands of years ago, probably faced in China. Of course, plants have always come and people too. Both my home islands, site of migration and exchange for millennia. The denial of this is the basis of the delusion of the mythic rural idyll, static in collective imagination, our minds trapped in this common lie, false nostalgic imagery projected onto land we can no longer freely roam. The Enclosures Act destroyed rural life. It drove peasants living off the land with their skills in subsistence and their status in village communities into helpless poverty in cities. There, the newly landless and disenfranchised formed a huge labor force with no rights or power. The Industrial Revolution was built off their backs. The same Industrial Revolution being funded by the slave trade and the plantations grown on the claimed and enclosed land in the Caribbean. My ancestors there and the ones here, natives all, seemingly divided and controlled by the invention of racism, were really in solidarity all along through imperial bondage. It feels quite intense to like just start reading after that. <laughs> so I'm just gonna say something to break that. <clears throat> okay, so 
At the start of my growing journey, I quickly came to appreciate how little we value the work of growing food. It's rarely spoken of as an aspiration by people who dream of a future of meaning, worth, or wealth. It is demeaned and de denigrated and has disappeared from our view despite being the foundation of all that we do. We don't value, as we should, those who grow our food. I sowed a seed for the first time as an adult. Watching the seeds that I've sown germinate and grow, struggle in some instances through my lack of knowledge, and then thrive in spaces better suited to their needs, I realized how little I understood. I realized how I'd steered my life towards endeavors that caused me to drift further and further away from the understanding that nature is not an externality or a backdrop and far from an irrelevance. I realized that the powerful systems far larger than I benefit from encouraging us to all believe that this work is degrading, but they are wrong. Growing food is everything. <clears throat> As I seek to learn about who I am and what made me and what it means to call a place home, I'm quite certain that my searching would always have led me to the earth. While I find it excruciating to contemplate how it is this very work that confined my ancestors to lifetimes of exploitation, it is this work that has come to mean everything to me. This work is integral, essential, and ancestral. It is an act of reclamation to find dignity in growing the plants that feed people. In the moments of steady and gentle repetition, carefully taking each tiny seed from the crease lines in the palm of my hand and softly nudging it under moist compost with my fingertip, I see myself dancing the same peaceful dance of my ancestors. The sway of playing, placing hopeful seeds into welcoming soil is a tiny gesture, a tender offering that has upheld humanity for the longest time and will be repeated until we cease to exist. In stepping towards this work and calling it my own, I know I am singing the same song that my ancestors sang when they committed themselves to the earth in the service of their family, their community, their people and their land and in service of the natural world that would meet them with the same generosity and commitment. No matter the challenges of the seasons before, as soon as the weather gestures towards the possibility of spring, I return to my box of seeds. Each seed is the accumulation of generations of pollination and reproduction, selection and adaptation. Each seed contains all that I need to start anew wherever I find myself. Within its DNA are the imprints of the lives of those who cultivated each plant and the way that seed was passed from parent to child, from grower to neighbor, from friend to friend. And it's through this succession of cultivating and sharing that we have this precious inheritance. The work of growing food is a precious inheritance too, one that I have taken up with my whole heart. Where once I would have been ashamed to have soil under my fingernails, I now wear my grubby hands with pride. Through growing food, I see the threads that weave through and between all things, and I bear witness to how profoundly we are tied to one another. From verdurous outbreath to mammalian inbreath, from petal unfurling to reveal a dusty yellow stamen to the soft nudge of a fuzzy bumblebee. From pollen meeting stigma to the incremental transformation that follows, cells dividing and multiplying into the gentle swell of fruit. From the plants that grow in seemingly implausible places to the fungi that help the trees talk amongst themselves, to the bowls that spill over with steamed rice or sauteed greens or fiercely hot red chilies. So you both have slightly different approaches, but as I said, you both are very much in recognition of this sort of the, how political our relationships with the land are, both in a sort of societal sense, but also personally. Um, and tonight's talk obviously is called, called Subversive Gardening. Um, I wondered if you could tell us a bit more about how you feel that the acts of gardening might be subversive or, subversive or radical and is that something that you always felt conscious of or something that grew as your relationship with gardening grew and evolved? I really like the name of this talk because actually for a long time my tagline on social media was gardening as a subversive act. <laughs> um, so for me, the idea of gardening as subversive came from my psych so I'm a psychotherapist, and it came from my from that background, where you know we kind of often psychotherapy is kind of sold as this thing where you have some talking therapy and you cure your symptoms and you feel better. But I remember in my training, for the kind of psychoanalytic perspective that I kind of came at it with, really you were in pursuit of the truth you are assisting the person that you're working with to unpick all of the false narratives, all the delusional beliefs, all of the false constructs that they've kind of created um, 
to avoid pain of some kind and helping them to find a, a, a way of living that is truthful. And for me, gardening feels very similar to that. Um, that actually when you come into contact with soil and you cut through all of the nonsense of this late capitalist dystopia that we live in now um, and come to the truth of what it is that the, the things that you are tending and you as you are tending these creatures in the soil, what life needs to thrive that's, that's quite subversive, actually. You're, you're interrupting all of the kind of false structures that, that we have been inculcated in for a really long time. Um, and you're interrupting the power structures that uphold that. So I think, that, I think there's something extremely subversive about the, about the act of taking yourself into relationship with, with, the, you know, with the world around you. I think for me, <clears throat> because... Um, I mean, while, while I'm often called a gardener, I'm, I'm a, I consider myself to be a food grower because that is principally my growing practice. Um, my, we, we, I started growing in cities, and so um, very quickly I came to understand that to do anything other than to build on land in spaces where land is, is such a commodity and it is so coveted and is used in order to accumulate wealth as an asset, to do something... As, as humble and so as devalued as to grow food into it was inherently radical. And I think that very quickly growing in a city became a kind of framework through which I could come to understand the way that kind of power operates in terms of land and uh, yeah, a, a, a asset wealth accumulation. And, and that translates, when you, especially when you extrapolate it out wider than you know the kind of small parcels of the land that I was growing onto, uh, what that looks like in in politics, in society, who actually gets to kind of move the pieces of the way in which our society is, is constructed is inherently connected to land. You know, the, the a huge swathes of land are still owned by by families that have um, ancestry that harks back to kind of the William William the Conqueror and and the Norman Conquest. You know, and those those families have have parceled that land off that is, you know, and, and made it impossible for most people to access and still wield enormous influence over, over politics and over, you know, the kind of invisible power structures that we are all, all of us normal people are not participating in or are not able to participate in. And so whilst that might seem like sort of abstract, like even the very act of doing this work in that city space was... Uh, yeah, a prism through which I could understand the way the power operated. And so I think that when you are able to engage in land-based practices in spaces where it is um, unlikely, I think that there is the possibility of having these conversations that um, then can kind of continuously open up wider and wider and wider and, and, and interrogate, you know, yes, the way that capitalism operates, the way that power is accumulated and is held by very few, the way that those who m might want to and, and might need to engage in, with, with the land are, have that completely held away from them by p those who are holding land as an asset and accumulating wealth on the back of it. So, yeah, I mean, it's incredibly political. Did you find that it was actually growing that led you to those to those thoughts. 100%. Yeah, so 100%. that's 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 for me that it, I feel that it, it it affects your thinking, and you then start thinking differently, and you then start questioning the structures in which we find ourselves. And I think you don't do that until you start to come into contact and relationship with. That was very much my question. That rather than it being a a considered radical act at the first moment that you yeah, engaged right. with the soil. It was something that grew from mm. your relationship with the soil. As, yeah, as for me, it, it was taste was like the vector. Like I was so excited by the the practice of growing food because it's just something like you know, I think we both have this in common. Like we just got families who who take food incredibly seriously. It's a huge part of our identity. But until I was in my late twenties, I hadn't even thought about where our food came from, and I hadn't even considered what the process looks like for our food to grow and for it to you know move from the ground all the way to the shops or you know and so when I came into contact with that process for the first time when I was living in New York I was just so captivated that that was the way that I came into it I was just like it tastes amazing and I'm this process is incredible and I kind of 
and, and so, you know, the food system was also like, and the politics surrounding that was one of the things that compelled me the most. But the, all of that is completely deeply connected to the way that land um, is tracked almost directly to the way that power operates. And I feel like for both of you as well, it's about reclamation mm -hmm. of that. So taking back the power, even if it's in a, in a very simple way in terms of what's available to you about what you can tr control, um, not in the sense of controlling nature, but what you can engage with. Um. For me, it's more of a reparation yeah. is how I think of it uh, in, in terms of a repair. Yeah. Um, and I grow for beauty more than for food. Um, and it was actually Claire's writing that made me realize that the thing that was really making me feel very itchy and uncomfortable about growing food was probably a history of ancestors who had been enslaved to work on the land, actually, um, that I hadn't ever consciously thought about. Um, but to me, the growing of, of nourishment for my self, my mm. whole self, and my family in, in the, you know, the context of our garden is, is one of reparation. It's one of repairing a relationship that feels incredibly damaged um, and that has felt damaged through the generations. Um, so it feels like ancestral work, really. That, yeah, that was going to be my next point, actually, is that it feels that there's, again, with both of you, this incredible sense of healing that can come through... I, I, I sort of hesitate to say gardening now, but much more that the relationship with... No, but it, it's about, like, as you say, nourishment, it's about nurturing, and it's about how the ability to nurture something else, to help that not just survive but thrive, actually can bring that back to you yourself um, and help you identify things within yourself and, and nurture yourself, mm. I guess. I think, I think for me it's more about... Um, the like uh, coming to understand the process of what it means to kind of participate in the thriving of, of the plants that you grow is more about relationship and kinship and about understanding how we are an intrinsic part of an ecosystem and that we can be um we can be a part we can participate in that ecosystem in a really in generative and really nourishing way and and i think that particularly when you kind of in, it, introduce that kind of piece about around belonging that particularly was very important for me i think because um you know the thing that i danced with f for the longest time was the deep unbelonging of being born in this country but not feeling of this you know being born on this land but not feeling of this land mm -hmm. and so um and so for me as opposed to it being like very specifically nourishing in that respect I think there was an it's, it, it's a spiritual philosoph philosophical understanding of that our belonging is intrinsic and that when you participate in being part of an ecosystem that truth arises consistently you can see that you are you're part of the cycles you are part of you you, you come to be in relationship with the plants and you do what they what you can to ensure that they thrive and thus the creatures that join you in the garden thrive and then you know the people around you when you if you're growing food or you're growing for beauty thrive also and it's like i think that's that for me is where that understanding comes in um yeah i think that's that and and and, and for me i was i, I think i don't necessarily know that i was searching for this but it is where i sort of have come to and it's something that i cultivate is an understanding of belonging that kind of transcends nationhood that can transcend any specific land mass it's more about yes a cultivation of a belonging that is about relationship to the to the natural world and thus each other and all the systems that uphold us so yeah it's a bit esoteric but it's true yeah, but I mean, it's the truth <laughs> yes yeah and your experience yeah i mean i agree wholeheartedly with you in that whole sense of our intrinsic um belonging to the network of all that lives around us that, that we are kind of part of. I find the narrative of nature as healing to be a really um, difficult one. And actually, I kind of think, of it, think about it when you kind of fl flipped on its head. It's not so much that coming to and having a relationship with nature he heals you and makes you feel better. I think in having, in having forgotten our place as animals who belong to the ecosystem of this planet, we have gone mad. Mm. It is a madness. Um, and it is a profound rift in our psyches that we are seeing playing out around us. You know, our species is on a suicide mission yes. with 
climate catastrophe. And I genuinely think that it is because we have, you know, it is, it is our madness. We, we've, we've dislocated ourselves. Yeah, from, we've lost our way completely. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's much more profound than this nice narrative of your garden and it makes you feel, feel better. better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, unfortunately, this is a very short chat, mm -hmm. so I just need to check on the time. Um, I'm going to go from something very esoteric and profound to something slightly more pragmatic, um, because I imagine there's probably, if, if there aren't already people working with the soil here, there's probably going to be some people who are very inspired by you to do so. If there is anyone who's just starting out and um, doesn't know where to start, could you share a bit, of, I mean, obviously, you, you've told us a bit that, about you first started in the city, but how you both really began to engage and if there's any learnings or tips that you would share? I mean, I would just say begin a relationship with the place in which you find yourself. It is about relationship. And I lived without any kind of garden for a very long time. We, we, the garden that I write about, the garden we moved to, we moved there just before the pandemic. That was the first time we'd ever had a garden, but I had started a journey towards it um, through thinking about belonging and wondering about belonging and wondering about how I, as an immigrant to this place, I was born in the Caribbean in Trinidad and felt brought here, I think through pulled along the, the, the force lines of colonialism, mm -hmm. but really wondering about how can I find a sense of belonging. And I looked at plants, actually. And it was the, the very first plant with, with, with which I had a relationship, I remember well, was a weed, green alkanet, growing in the cracks of the concrete in our car park where we lived. Um, and so I genuinely, I really think you, do, you, know, you don't need a garden. We should all have gardens. We should all have access to land <laughs> in which mm. we can put our hands and root ourselves. But to begin, you need to think about having a, rela a, a reciprocal relationship, which is really vulnerable because it means opening yourself up as well to, well, what do these plants think about me? What do they make of me and my car parking here? You know, what do they make of, of, my, of my interactions in their space, actually? Mm -hmm. But really starting to be curious and open about that. Um, that's where I would begin. It's where I started. Look around you. I mean, mine's going to be much more pragmatic, <laughs> much less poetic. But like the way that I started was, well, the, the, when I found my way to uh, the, the farm that I started um, volunteering at in New York, it was completely by chance. But the thing that I found was generally growers and gardeners, even if they're busy, they're generous. And they will always, always, always appreciate a hand. And so when I moved back to London and was like determined to find places to, to cultivate this this thing that I'd found that to search out, search out, search out I, I just went to any garden that was open and would have me, any community garden, any city farm, like any space that, would, that was open to, to people visiting. And I basically just offered up like, what are you doing? Can I also do it if you explain to me what, um, what's going on? And it's quite easy to talk and also be doing the act of growing. And I find that, yeah, growers and gardeners are pretty generous people with their knowledge and there's not a lot of gatekeeping. Well, that's not true. Depends. Community <laughs> gardeners, sorry. Community, in community spaces or like, yeah, it's open hearted spaces that are looking to bring people in and volunteers, et cetera, are generally really open hearted spaces and, um, and generous spaces. Uh, so yeah, that's why I said, seek out people who know what they're doing and ask questions. And, and do you feel that those spaces have increased? I think recently? so. I think like they're increasing. I think there's always pressure on them. I, th I feel like they're, they're sort of blooming and, and dying as well but because there's so much pressure on land, especially in city spaces. But I think there's, um, there's a hunger for them and I think people are really putting themselves out there and creating spaces which are incredible. Also, create a space. You could just definitely do that. It's amazing how people will congregate around it because there's such a hunger for it right now. So yeah. if you find an underused piece of land, just don't ask permission, do just stop playing <laughs> <something. laughs> yeah, Just do it. Um, we've got a little time for any questions, if there are any. Oh, there's one over there. Is there a mic? If you just hold on for a second for the microphone, thanks. Yeah, just over there. Can you put your hand up again? Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm really interested in land use, and you're both very eloquent about um, growing, whether it's food or for beauty. I'm interested, though, in, in sort of non-human 
use of land, um, particularly you know, biodiversity and rewilding. Have you had any thoughts on that? So many, and I don't think we've got any time for that. But what I would say is that when it comes to my food growing practice, I was trained to grow organically, um, whatever you want to call it, uh, nature-centric, whatever. I, I, I don't think that there's any other way that we can afford to do it. And so there are lots of practices that are completely ingrained in the way that we, go, we grow food that can be of benefit to the ecosystem. Arguably, you can't actually grow food without a thriving ecosystem surrounding and interacting with our spaces that we grow in. But, um, but yeah, when it comes to rewilding, we might have another, need another hour and 12. <laughs> I mean, my very brief thoughts on it is that there can be a narrative, I think, that our presence in a space is harmful inherently. Um, I disagree with that. I think we have a harmful relationship with the places around us, but I think humans have walked and touched and tended and loved this earth for a very long time. And I think we can do that again <laughs> if we relate to the land differently. Um, so I don't think rewilding necessarily means banishment of humans well, from the space. That. That's why. Yeah, I think that's the main problem is that there's a, there's a, there's a compartmentalization of uh, spaces, and that to me looks like neo-colonialism, and often behaves in exactly the same way. And so I think that when we are looking at spaces that we want to be thriving and biodiverse, that should be also including human beings. Um, any any other questions? I think we've just got one Great question, minute. by the way. Oh, just over here. Thank you very much. I just want to ask that um, both of you kind of situate your growing in a political context and kind of put it on a timeline of reclamation from colonialism to your work now. And I was just wondering that as the kind of movements that you guys put yourselves in, if there was like a next step or if you see it as quite a, I guess, like quite a singular individualistic pursuit. <laughs> I mean, if, well, if you read, if you read my book and, and I'm, uh, where we end up is like we talk about reparations and, and that looks like a number of different things. Principally, I mean, obviously it's not so tr true in this particular, well, maybe it is, I suppose, in the context of this particular island, but that looks like la land back in in colonised nations. So I talk about Mauritius and sp specifically and there is a... A, a situation of kind of neo-colonialism that is playing out now with, in terms of this archipelago that is adjacent to the, not adjacent, but in the same sea as the island. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's it's about what reparations can really look like, and that is both a political pro project, I think, but also it is an ecological project. I think reparations looks like you you know rightly rooted the word in repair when we're talking about whatever we want to call it. We could even call it rewilding. It has to have a reparative um, framework. And that is about adjust, uh, you know, addressing injustice and uh, historical in, in inequality, inequity, and yeah, what does what does a kind of just movement look like going forward? I think it's possible to have like an individual growing practice, but that can, that can be extrapolated into greater political movement. Yeah, in terms, I mean, that's a huge question. <laughs> um, in terms of grounding my practice and where we are, I think we are still in. We are still colonized. <laughs> our minds are colonized, our bodies are colonized, our time is colonized. We are enslaved, I believe, to the system in which we, you know, it's not, we're no longer bound by actual metal chains, but we're bound by psychological ones. Um, and it is very deep, hard work to notice when you're engaging in it and then to kind of try and pick that apart um so you know the timeline is now <laughs> you know we're, we're we're still we're still in it um and you know the revolution can happen any time please um i'm afraid i think that's all we've got time for um I wish we had more time. We didn't even, you know, you, you, you mentioned it briefly just then about a, a little while ago about, about, you know, about being rooted in the ground. There's, there's so much we could discuss. Um, 
I suggest you both, you all read the books, rather not you both, you read both books. <laughs> Just the two of you in the audience there read those books. Uh, yeah. Um, and I really hope that we do get a chance to continue this conversation. Sorry we didn't cover more. <laughs> I know, but it was, you know, it's a, it's a chat. It's an art chat, not an art talk. And there's more to come this evening. So thank you so much, both. Thank you. Um, I thank hope you. we've left it on an optimistic note that we do, there is an opportunity for us to, to reclaim our place within the ecology of this world and not to uh, think of ourselves as separate anymore. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks for doing. I'll just pop it on the chat.
Do you know what? Like, you yes. move so much, I'm not worried about you. No, no, like, no. I move a lot, but like, but in a way, it's different when you think about it. But like, um, it's like, yeah, just doing, I'm just, I started this year just going, like, going for something quickly, like, something more, but also I'm just starting to start doing weights. Yes, and not exactly. Like, I'm not going to crazy weight, yeah. because I just don't want my bones to fucking yeah. disintegrate. Yeah, like, yeah, a bit. I didn't work in a, I don't work as well as I used to, it's not very in the okay. market anymore, so okay. I do need to think about, like, yeah, yeah, how more low berry stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. She's like a super, 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 no, things aren't breaking down. The breakdown, the breakdown you're preparing for is your 60s. Like, yeah, yeah, that's when like osteoporosis just starts showing. This is why we start. Loads of time. Right, just oh, remember. Wait <laughs> Yeah, no. Yeah. I'm going to do some yeah. fucking deadlifts. Yeah, and deadlifts, seriously. Seriously. I'm going to start with another one. I know. There is part of me that's like, I look like a fucking donkey, but I'm like... <laughs> in the gym, like, you do your thing. Thing, on, like, the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're like, this is enough for me. Yeah, it's like, can you go in my own? You should make it to the gym. Some of us are still like, so like, no, no, no. It, was, it was because I was, I was, I was here. Yeah, it was like, something that happened.
sun was like right in my eyes and I could not I think we'll start in a, in a minute, but check, 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 cool. Check. Is anyone into architecture? If, is, this, is this style like Frank Lloyd Wright-ish, or is that just someone who's not into architecture who just thinks strange windows equals Frank Lloyd Wright? Anyone, anyone design? 
surely. No? Okay. I thought I'd open it up with, start off with my ignorance, and then we can all see that we start off in the same place in life. We are no better than anyone here, even though we are about eight centimeters higher than you off the ground. Boom, eight, okay, all right. Welcome, everyone. Hello, welcome to the Tate Modern. Wow, what a weird sentence from me. Uh, um, for this, which is an arts chat um, brought to you by CounterPoints Arts, um, who are an incredible organization who I've worked with since 2016, CounterPoints Arts program um, refugee week every year and do lots of different um, schemes, artists, link-ups, um, scratch events and like seminars where artists can, artists from a migrant background or whose work deals with migration can meet up, share each other, share work, become friends and then have a support network um, which may just be a consequence of what they do and not their main thing but Anyway, I'm someone who's worked with them. My name is Awate. I'm a rapper by trade. I'm also a filmmaker and a, a writer and curator and stuff like that. And I'm here with someone who's very special to me for so many reasons. Um, and I'll let them introduce themselves. But to my left is Matt Foote. Woo. So I'm um, a criminal defense solicitor and I um, was privileged to represent Awati about 10 years ago in a series of cases that came quite fast after each other, about four different cases um, with the police. Um, shall I carry on or just carry on with the story? I, mean, I think the, 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 what comes out of that story is that none of those arrests should have happened. Um, no prizes for guessing uh, why those arrests took place. But I'd, I'd just describe some of what happened there. The, the first arrest was, was Awate on his own estate, the Maiden Lane estate, listening to music on his headphones. Some PCSOs, some sort of what, what other people call fake police, coming onto the estate and harassing him for no reason other than he was just listening to music. He didn't want to talk to them. He walked across his estate and they followed him and they arrested him and they charged him with two charges of assault on police officer. And he had a trial in Highbury Corner and there are several reasons why he was acquitted in that trial. Um, some of them because of who Awati is, they hadn't realized what they were dealing with was a very special person of good character who had tremendous support uh, from his uh, friends, including a character reference from the local MP, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, um, before he became leader, who was only, were delighted to give a reference because Awati is a friend of his son. But he was also lucky um, as can happen in these cases. Someone took a film of his arrest, and my memory of the story is that they didn't want to come forward, and they contacted a friend, and the friend was called Barry Sharp, who's a very impressive uh, individual in the 90s music scene, who also helped set up a music label called Duffer of St. George. And I, I knew Barry through my work, and he said you should go and see Matt Foote and the footage came that way, that's my memory. And that footage proved that Awati was telling the truth and the police were lying and uh, he, he was acquitted. Uh, I just want to add one little story just to slightly ruin Awati's street cred in that case. One nice little bit of evidence we were able to put in was from the local paper when he was at school, at primary school, 
at Brecknell Primary S School. S secondary. Um, secondary. Oh, depends, was it? Uh, I think it was the primary, but we will see. Yeah, we'll see. I was in the Camden New Journal every year for some <laughs> yeah. reason. So they go to the school, to the Highbury Corner, the same, same court that he had his trial in, to have a look at the, how the trial process works. And Awati um, himself uh, puts his hand up to be the prosecutor in the court. And there's a picture of him as a young school child, as the prosecutor. And we put that forward as part of the character that he was, uh, that they were prosecuting the prosecutor. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so we've just gone straight into it. So I'll just carry on there, which is, by the way, this is an open talk. So at any point, if anyone wants a clarification, if there is a question that you have, a burning thought, please say it, please put your hand up and we can have a mic come to you. So please, um, well, there's some time at the end for questions. This is just an open-ended talk between a musician and a very good lawyer. Um, and yeah, so that's how we want it to be. So you're part of that conversation, please please be part of it. Um, so with that, yeah, so basically that was my first, my first arrest that led to me having to go to trial. I got arrested when I was a kid, when I was 15, for selling CDs in Carnaby Street. Uh, and nothing ever happened with that. I just got arrested by some guy. He said, you've got uh, CDs on you. We think you've stolen them from a, from a music shop. Why would I have stolen 10 of the same CD, sir? I know this person. I'm selling their CD on their behalf. What are you doing? I got paraded, put in the cell for like seven hours. I was 15 years old and then just released when a police officer said, if you know that artist, you should have their phone number. I said, I've been telling you I do. Please call them. They called them and I just got released. Didn't get a buy. I didn't get a thank. It, like, we're sorry it happened uh, or anything like that. Um, uh, yeah, so that was my first arrest. But this one on the estate is one which Matt, Matt is describing. Um, two things that were in the Camden Journal, funnily enough, which uh, we found was one clipping from 2001 where I was uh, writing with my primary school at Brettnock and uh, we had a book published and we were at the Owl Bookshop in Kentish Town and I was wearing a t-shirt in that Camden New Journal picture that said Refugee Week. So that all comes back to this and counterpoints arts and why I'm here today. Um, and that other picture, yeah, I, was, uh, a pros I, was, I won the mock trial competition from my secondary school um, at Highbury Magistrates, and that was the same court which uh, I, I went to for this first trial, which was uh, discontinued the morning of the trial, which if you've never been under arrest, if you've never been charged, if you've never had a trial coming up for yourself, if you've had someone around you that has, you may be able to feel this, but my mental health was completely deteriorating in those three to four months from March until June or July when the trial was. And for them to, on the day of the trial, admit they don't have enough evidence to proceed and so what, we're not gonna get a trial? No. So all of the, I went to Matt's office about 20 times to talk about all of the traumas that, went, that happened on that day and it was just unbelievable to me that that happened and it similarly a similar similar thing happened on my third arrest which matt also was um my uh, solicitor for um so yeah why are we here because um my work mainly deals with migration as i'm a, a refugee from eritrea from eritrea double diaspora i was born in saudi arabia and i grew up in a sink estate which is a council estate which Tony Blair's government kind of brought up this, this word, right? Sink estate, which is just uh, all, all the, the crap kind of swells into the bottom of the sink, right? And that's, that's the, the government phrase for the type of place that they allowed me to be raised in um, is that. Um, and um, I thought it would be interesting because I know I only knew who Matt was because of another musician who I'd been touring with and who was a, a good friend of mine who was arrested at the student protests. And from that, I saw that so many people that had been, that you'd represented were from different diasporas or were either arrested at like a, 
you know, the, the, the Lebanon protests in 2006, or um, anti-Iraq war protests, or anti-Syria protest, anti-Syrian war protests, or Palestine protests, or um, people from Sri Lanka, like the amount of different diasporas that you, as a as a as a as a solicitor, see, and you, and the personal touch of you coming to my house for a lot of these things, with that, and I've heard from people that that doesn't happen with a lot of lawyers. Um, from my experiences being at the magistrate's court at my arraignment, which is where it's your, whether you plead guilty or not guilty, I saw people sat in the, in the hall outside the courts who were just sat there, people who looked like me, and then just some guy just tapping them on the shoulder being like, hey, hey you Jamal? Yeah, cool, I'm your lawyer, um, this is what we're gonna do. And at that point, I'd already met, met you three or four times. I'd been to your office several times. You'd been to my house and had tea with my family to reassure them about what the process was. Because you don't know what the process is when you haven't been through it. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to ask you what, that is, what, that's, what's, what that's been like, representing people who come from the world and who maybe still have a sense of justice because their parents were freedom fighters. My parents were revolutionaries from Eritrea, but Equally, my friends from uh, Chile, or my friends from Bangladesh, also, their families were involved in some sort of struggle, and their kids are getting arrested on protests. So I just want to know what that's been like. I, I remember, as if it was yesterday, coming to your house and meeting your parents, and that, that common thing you get of the terrible fear uh, that the, their child is going to be pushed down the wrong the wrong path and also slight suspicion as to whether you bought anything on yourself and having to reassure them that this was all uh, put together by the police and that we would do everything we could to 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 to, to, to get the right result but it, you, you can't promise that result and it was hard work that you did uh, and that I think they assisted in the background um, but it is a very scary uh, situation, uh, I think particularly for people who, who come from, from different countries having to deal with the criminal justice system. So, I, I mean, just on the general point on that, I think the, the, the Labour's Terrorism Act in 2000 prescribed all sorts of groups in this country, and they tagged on to the end uh, the, the Tamils and Kurds so whole communities were being prescribed if they supported the groups that they already supported. And that was really the Blair government saying that we side against the dissidents with the people who run those countries. I mean, the, the, the story of Sri Lanka is absolutely atrocious. Uh, they were supporting the butcher Raja Paksa, who went on to kill 30,000 Tamils in the north of Sri Lanka. And at the, just before they did that, about six months, a year before they did that. They were prosecuting uh, leading community Tamil uh, people in this country for supporting Tamil Tigers. So it, it was a terrible thing they did to take sides. And it was very, very scary for, for those people to be prosecuted under the, under the Terrorism Act. Very serious. Um, some of them came through unscathed, not completely unscathed, um, w with, with a big trial that we had then. And something that, coming from a country, my parents are from Eritrea, where there was a war for 30 years from 1961 until 1991. Um, so in that situation, there's no real forms. You know, my mom doesn't have birth certificate because she was born during the war. My dad does because he was born when Britain controlled Eritrea. My grandmother does because she was born when Italy controlled Eritrea. Um, but in that sort of situation, even though there's an understanding that the imperialists have created a lot of this and there's a socialist or communist, Marxist-Leninist understanding of politics in the world, when my parents and people of my parents' generation have come here, they generally still see it as, you know, the Magna Carta was written here. Like, this is where justice happens. And it took so much for... Um, my parents to be able to acknowledge the fact that this was a super 
racist country which does violent violence onto its children and uh, the children who grow up here, the people who are undocumented, people who are disabled, people who have mental health issues, people in the LGBT community. It is, it's another world actually, and we're treated as if, um, as if we're colonial subjects in a, a colony. Um, I watch Star Wars a lot now, and when I watch Andor, it's so similar to The Wind That Shakes the Barley it's so similar to Eritrea. It's so similar to, um, to how young black people in London, because it's the easiest thing to go to, because I am one, but also that's what a lot of the policing is meant, is the violent force is just meant to beat us up. How we're treated like it's a, an intergalactic fascist space force with something that we'll get into, like the gangs matrix and things like that. But it took, it, it didn't, my parents didn't clock after me being excluded more than 100 days out of my primary school or another 100 days out of my secondary school. It was only when these started to happen in my early to mid-20s that they realized, no, this country's, it's a mess. There is no justice here. Oh, I thought that if, I didn't think that it's because it's, it's a white guy, you know, who's arresting my son, but I thought if there's someone English, like British, with the, with the, with the ER on the, on the helmet, that was arresting my son, surely was, they must have a good reason. But it was only after all of those that my parents properly apologized. My mom apologized to me. So, you know, I'm guessing you've seen that from people who, even though they knew that Britain was the reason why their country was, were at war and had civil wars, when they came here, they still trusted it. I don't know if anyone else had that experience or that feeling. Yeah, I've, I've definitely seen that. Um, but I, I just wanted to mention something you reminded me of, which is part of being a lawyer in this situation is to learn. You know, I, did, I remember when I first met you, I didn't know anything about Eritrea. And I remember you saying, um, read Refugee Boy by Benjamin Zephaniah, which, is, which I went and read and as a fantastic <laughs> introduction to the civil war with, with Ethiopia and helps you understand the thing. So there's a whole learning process uh, that you have, to, you have to understand in order to understand what people have been through before they've even been arrested. Um, but I agree with you that there can be uh, a sentiment amongst elders within the community that still believe the myth about British justice. And I think more often it, it can be the youth that's sort of teaching their, their parents that what's actually going on. I mean, today, I mean, there, there's with the police, it seems like there's barely a week that goes by without some terrible story. It's almost like daily now where they seem to be caught out lying. I mean, this thing in Cardiff was just unbelievable, wasn't it? I mean, they said, we weren't chasing this bike, and there's a picture of them chasing the bike. And then everyone's saying, well, you are chasing the bike. And then they say, OK, yes, we might have been chasing the bike. I mean, it's all, this is sort of, in, it seemed incapable of telling, telling the truth. And I think these things start to break that down. I think it's much harder to hold that idea, but it was much stronger, I'd say, 10 years ago. Yeah, and a similar incident happened um, on Cali Road a few years ago as well, um, where police chase young people on, on bicycles and on vehicles and lead, lead to their death, and then lie and say they weren't, um, which then leads to a bigger... Uh, response from the public who are grieving. Um, can I ask you about the current <laughs> changes to the law, to the policing, you know, the policing bill, and you know, if you've also had to deal with the migrate new migration bill in any of your with any of your clients or anything, and, and what uh, changes there have been? I mean, with these two, there's two big acts that have come in on protests. One, one the police bill, and one the public order uh, bill that acts. Um, the police bill act that came in last year under um, Patel gives the police massive discretion. So we've got this ridiculous contradiction where we have these enormous reports, the Casey Review, that says the police are institutionally racist. Um, the uh, Daniel Morgan Review that says the police are institutionally corrupt. But they are giving vast discretion to the police in how they protest. And what the Police Act did was allow the police to limit 
the length of a protest, to outlaw noisy protest, and to outlaw protests that's seriously annoying. Now, if you think about that, what are you left with? Uh, a very short protest that's silent, that doesn't annoy anyone. That's not actually protest at all, that's just obedience. It's the opposite of protest, and that's what they want, us just to light a candle, maybe. Maybe we're not even allowed to do that. It's so anodyne that it means that we are just to be submissive. And so it's going to be tested time and again. Um, one thing I would say on the positive is that whenever they've been repressive in history, there's always been a response. And there is, the law has been pushed back by mass action. Um, and, and so I don't feel at all that it's hopeless. And you know, if you think about the Black Lives Matter movement, it just came out of nowhere. There were, there were massive protests because a black man was killed in America. There were massive protests across the world, not just in this country. And it, it gave a whole new momentum to challenging racism within the curriculum and all sorts of places. Yeah, and when you say we can challenge it, one case that comes to mind is a few years ago, two people, one of which was a priest, I think, snuck into um, an RAF or BAE Systems airbase and damaged the wings and some other parts of a, of a, like a fighter jet or a bomber or something like that. Um, do you know of this case? And they, they got sent to trial and they somehow got off because they were able to argue that this was going to do harm they, as individuals, were convinced that this was going to do harm and was against international law, and so them trespassing on a BAE Systems factory site and damaging a fighter jet, which is super illegal, right? They go off, right? Uh, and, and the fact that the, the, with the new policing bill, I just wanted to know if, whether stuff like that it can still happen. Because so, as the defendant, something that I found which was so amazing was how much the law is just based on philosophy because we're using words all the time. We're not actually like doing movements. How does that make you feel? <laughs> like, we're not doing that. Do you know what I mean? Because we're doing actual words, we have to debate what the definition of every single word in the sentence means. And like... How I got off on the fourth one, that was my favorite one, right? Because I got convicted of the fourth one, um, my fourth case in two years. I got convicted of it, and then we won on appeal. And we won on appeal because they were, uh, I was charged with two counts of obstructing arrest, which in total means that I've got six counts of resisting arrest, uh, or no, six counts of assault on PC and two counts of obstructing arrest, which I love. Um, but it... it they were two counts of obstructing arrest and one racially aggravated section five, which basically I started a race riot. Me, little old me, somehow. What was the situation, you ask? Well, in Cricklewood, little old Cricklewood, right, on the high street, there is a McDonald's and there's a KFC next to the McDonald's and loads of fascist groups a coalition of fascist groups from all over the United Kingdom, from Newcastle, from Berkshire, from, from Dover, from all over, came down to Cricklewood because they thought the Muslim Brotherhood, the Egyptian political party, had their uh, headquarters above the KFC. So an entire community um, responded, right? It was p uh, parents, it was teachers, it was literally children. It was like a festival in the street to stop the fascists from, uh, from having a procession. About 60 fascists did come and they all met at the train from all of their respective parts of the United Kingdom. They went halfway up the road. They realized, no, we can see an imam and a priest and black bloc. We're not going to make it. They decided to turn back. The police were supposed to take them back home, but they didn't. Because about an hour and a half later, I ran into some of these dirty Nazis and they told me to go back to where I came from and there was a little incident then. And then in, in the midst of that incident, there were about six other um, fascists. Some of them were in, England, were in England tops who were in the outside garden area of a pub on the high street and they were doing monkey noises and saying, uh, stick your Allah up your this and saying lots of racist stuff which 
is a racially aggravated section five. Mm. But when the riot police came and they saw me pick up an, a, a, a union flag off the ground and rip it in half and say, fuck your queen, fuck your flag, fuck your country, this mixed race police officer right next to me lost his mind and arrested me. So that led to a whole situation. I've somehow got out of the cuffs because they didn't put them on me. They put, they put the cuffs back on me. They beat me up. They put me in a van, beat the shit out of me in the van with my hands cuffed behind my back. Took me out of the van, which is when my music video for Out Here starts. As soon as I come out of one van and get put in another van, Matt, why would they have taken me in one van and put me in another? Where's the audio recording of me getting beat up? And which van do they write down on the piece of paper that is the one that has the audio recording of me not being beat up? That's why they took me out of one van and put me in another at the beginning of my music video out here, which involves the real clip of this incident happening. Um, but anyway, when we went to court, at half time in the first trial, the one that I got convicted of, we had to argue um, with Matt's uh, amazing notes, um, young Mr. Bindman, Jacob Bindman, who was my barrister, had to argue that it's impossible for me to get charged with racially aggravated Section 5 because fuck your queen, fuck your flag, fuck your country in so many different ways. I am a British citizen. I'm allowed to say whatever I want about my, about my flag and my, even though I hate the flag and it's not my, I don't see it as my flag. We said to the courts, it is my flag and I love it and I can rip it up because they have corrupted it with their Nazism and their fascism. I said, fuck your flag, not fuck the flag, not fuck the queen's flag. I did say fuck your queen, but his queen because he thinks the queen is the queen and I think the queen is the queen too. But do you not understand how much it's philosophy? And that is what got me off on that one, right? Matt, how much of it is philosophy? It's ridiculous. Well, there's, a, there's always an argument over terms, but I want to finish, because we may not have much time, but with a question for you, because you've come through four cases and defeated them, and then you went on the offensive a few years ago, and I remember seeing you on the telly, and I thought it was just a wonderful sight to see you go on the offensive. I just want you to tell people what you did. Yes. Um, so, about six months ago now, um, the Met Police had to... We forced them into um, scra sort of scrapping their gang's violence matrix, which is a secret list of black boys, basically. A few of the people on there aren't black, uh, and very few aren't male, uh, or don't identify as male or as men, and that's it. It's a secret list of black people with thousands of names on it. Um, Six years ago, they took several names, they took half of the people off it without telling anyone who was on it, but they said, we removed half the names because we don't think they should be on it. Well, you shouldn't have the secret list. If you have a secret list and you think that it's an incorrect list, you shouldn't have it. This list affects people's right to housing, to their DVLA, you can't get a driver's license if you're on the, if you're on the gang's matrix. They could take your children away. You could have, uh, it could affect your right to education. And it affects your mental health and so many other things, your access to benefits and stuff like that. And you will never know whether you're on it. And people have been put on the gang's violence matrix for simply visiting a loved one who was stabbed. And because there's a police officer outside, if someone has been stabbed who takes everyone's name, that family member if you go and see someone who has been hurt in, in, in the midst of a crime, you could be on the gang's violence matrix and it could lead to you losing your job, not being able to get a particular type of job, maybe losing your driver's license, which could be the only way that you get money in the first place. And it continues this cycle of poverty and, and, and just hopelessness and trauma. And with Liberty, the human rights uh, organization, and with Unjust UK, another fantastic human rights organization, um, and two and a half or three years of fighting, we were able to get the police to kind of backtrack on a lot of it and say that it shouldn't happen. And like most of the people on the list won't be on, be on the list anymore and that they'd be able to find out if they were by doing a public ac a subject access um, request. So that's what happened. Um, and it wasn't a full victory, but it was a good thing, but it is one of those things where if you would have told someone this existed in my country, Eritrea, which is the number one on the lack of press freedom above North Korea like list, if you would have told people it was in Eritrea, it was in Myanmar, it was in China, this secret list of like citizens, it would make sense. 
But the fact that these scumbags do it in this country and anyway, I had a meeting with them that I can't t get into, but it was very disrespectful with the director, the head of, the director of intelligence at the Met said to me, I'm not an expert, please help us. <laughs> anyway, is there, are there any questions? <laughs> So the question was on the on philosophy and the fact that lots of people who are being arrested and jailed for protest are being gagged and censored by judges and not able to speak about why they did what they did. So there was a terrible case the other day where someone was um, put in prison for contempt of court for putting what they thought was their defence when they'd been told that the defence had been taken away from the jury. Uh, a very, very controversial decision taken by a judge to do that, which I think, because of the uh, backlash to that, probably won't be followed um, in the future, but is a, a real concern. W what is happening in some of the protest cases that are going on in the country at the moment is that defences are being taken away, um, and it's not, a, it's not an easy process uh, for people coming into the process if they don't know that the defense exists from the outside uh, from the outset it, it's quite difficult to represent people because you don't know whether the defense is going to be taken away in the middle of the trial or not and it's really a more of a an intrusion of the judiciary into the process um, it, you, I, I don't think we can argue that you can just run any defense and be allowed to say what you like but th there should be some latitude particularly in moral cases and protest cases, for people to be able to put the very reason why they went and carried out that action and that juries can hear that, um, so that juries can make up their mind about the context, even if, this, even if the technical defense doesn't exist. I think we'll get back to a bit more fluid, but it does feel that the judiciary are, are flexing their muscle on protest cases at the moment, which we need to make some noise about. So yeah, thank you for the question. Great question. Um, I, I think, I hope it wasn't too negative. Awati won his four cases, you know, but I agree. I, I sued them twice successfully. <laughs> it it, it does well. feel, you know, when you've got the state and what's going on. I also, I also think um, hist you have to draw on history and also current examples. I might just briefly mention the case of Rotherham 12. I represented um, uh, some Muslims in, in uh, the Asian community in Rotherham who have been attacked by... Um, fascists in their own community and they stood up and fought their case and they won and it was just incredibly moving uh, to see these people stand up to a charge of violent, dis of, of violent disorder where you go to prison um, and, and to defeat it and the jury completely understood it. It was an all white jury. So that I partly get it from work but also from history. Um, and you know you've got to draw on things like the suffragettes and the chartists and these these movements that ultimately won what they fought for by by being consistently mobilizing as many people as they could uh, in as effective action as they could uh, and we need to remember that the suffragettes um, were militant yeah they were they were divided there were two sides to it but there was a militant wing that was central to, to the victory of women winning the vote. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to leave it there, unfortunately. We've run out of time. But Matt has, a, has co-authored co a book called Charged, which is out now. It is on protest in the UK and uh, policing and, and uh, the responses to it. Um, 
I'd like to also say thank you to CounterPoint's Arts for having us and for everyone at the Tate as well and to Rebecca for uh, doing incredible BSL interpretation uh, throughout the day, I think, as throughout the evening. So thank you very much. Have a great evening and weekend.
They don't need another chair. Hello, 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 hello. Imogen, would you like to come over?
wanted to say. I don't want to put you off. Hello, welcome. Hello, hello. How's it going? How do we feel? Good. You, you were a bit hesitant. One more time. Just how do we feel? Yeah. Yeah, it's fri Friday, guys. Friday. Um, how do you feel? I feel fantastic being here with you. Yes, Imogen. same. Please, would you tell us who you are? Who am I? <laughs> I'm Imogen. Um, and I am a poet, an actor. Yes, you are. Um, and yeah, I'm kind of, this is very surreal right now. Um, it didn't feel real until everyone started turning up. Mm. So I'm kind of just like, what? Yeah. Who am I? I actually don't know <laughs> because right now I'm just seeing all these faces who you know, I've never seen before. And I'm like, okay, you guys want to take us in? Like, yeah. That really means something. So, yeah, I'm just really happy to be taken in. But, yeah, I'm a poet and an actor. Yes. Um, an amazing poet, an amazing actor. Yes. And I'm Jamal. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm also a poet. I, I can actually say I'm an actor now as well because I was yes. in The Second Woman uh, last week. We That's crazy. Um, but we are here um, to talk about our... Oh, wonderful amazing shared project yes not to toot our own horn right um but we did <laughs> uh, yeah we had an incredible incredible process yes. um working on this project uh and this was with the incredible liz johnson arteur um and she was kind enough to uh 
offer up her work essentially and say, here you go, what, what do you feel? What do you think with this? And um, working in collaboration as well with uh, Axel and the Shades podcast um, and the whole process of meeting Liz, uh, going through her different works. Uh, she has years and years worth of photos, which she calls the Black Balloon Archive. And some of those you see downstairs, uh, it's I think level four? Level three? three? Two? Thank you. No, level two, yeah. Yeah, level, two, yeah. Uh, yeah, you'll find it, it? <laughs> Time Don't Run Here exhibition. Um, and yeah, so some of the work is in there yeah. and we essentially were able to respond to that work. Um, we were given full liberty to do that however we felt. Yes. There was no parameter yeah. um, except just to respond mm -hmm. and essentially explore. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we kind of went from there and we created our piece, which we called Poetry as Protest, Protest as Poetry. Um, and we kind of arrived at this game because poetry and protest happened to be a massive part of the process we took to create this work in response to Liz's uh, work and archive. We were really stimulated by Liz's work downstairs on uh, Black Lives Matter protests happening in London. Yes. Um, and I think that really set like a, a kind of president mm. or a standard for us mm. um, as, as I was going to say as people, or sorry, I was going to say as artists, but I mean to say as people mm. uh, for which we want our work to be about. I think we understood that, oh yeah, like art, poetry, expression actually does have a power and um, is incredibly relevant and powerful in society. And I think that's what led us to being so uh, vocal in this piece of poetry, in mm -hmm. this piece of protest, yes. if that makes sense. Yes, definitely so. Um, Shall we? Shall we? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, a bit of context. We thought it would be, we thought it would make a lot of sense to actually share the poem uh, with this audience who might not be familiar with our work or even the work of Liz, for example. Um, and rather than really going out there and performing it as we did in Tape Modern previously with this really outlandish and in your face. Um, almost guerrilla protests, we, we felt mm. like maybe we just share a kind of intimate reading mm -hmm. with you all today. And so we've got our notebooks. Yes. Um, have we got some poetry fans in the room? Yeah, can we get some clicks? Yeah, yeah, fingers on the okay. ready, fingers on the ready. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Still. Wait, 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 sorry, sorry. I just wanna make sure I got it all down. Yeah. Sorry, sorry guys. And if you do want to hear the all out, um, you know. The final piece. Yeah, the final piece. Yeah, in its full performative yes. glory. It is on level two. It is on level two and you can hear it. It's coming out the speaker, so. It's for free, yeah. by the way. <laughs> Tell them we sent you. Yes, yes. Right. Um, ready? Hey. Hey. <laughs> Let me transport you. Black lives matter. Black lives have always mattered. Well, you know about that market smell. Eco-style hair gel. And auntie telling me she can do my hair nicely. Mm. I declined politely. I thought my cornrows looked all right today. But anyway, right we. See three daughters on the crimson bus. See, mum sets the trend with her leng curly pin-up. Among the girls, an array of sensibilities, nurtured from the order their apple has fallen from the tree. Mm. Say their names. Say our names. To be young and sprightly. To be old and rightly disgruntled by life strife with their life behind thee, though. Still giving it a crack anyway. Bear flies out today, heat and hemoglobin hunters, red blood cell punters. They think they have the authority to kill a minority. 
cursed us into not believing ourselves the global majority. But what you know about the time where our senses got the best of us? As some start their nine to five, daylight startled the rest of us. The calm down, when the sweat starts to dry and adrenaline wears off. Now we're spiraling like the Fibonacci sequence. I can see the influence of the night on your face. I wipe away lingering mascara and shame. I stand in solidarity with my brothers and sisters in the States. I stand in solidarity with my brothers and sisters in the States. See, my heart belongs to the dance. My heart, it beats to the march mm -hmm. of the tenor mm -hmm. of our people an undeviating course of culture and a fight to be as people is those militant eyes mm. that gather and protect when the popo wants to declare our brother as suspect car well onto him they project conspiracy of a roaming ic3 in a nike tech fleece it's seen through eyes that have already seen it's the accountability of the eye of our camera. It's Black Lives Matter. It's stop killing all the man them. Stop killing all the man them. Wind instruments made of water. It's see, my afro won't fit in this guillotine. Better luck next time with the slaughter. Brown brick could never block us into silence is violence. No justice, no peace. Dear police, what would you say to the person you chose to slay? Does it have to be in braille for you to fill our words? Stop killing the man then. Well, you know about communication, conversation. Ah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Sounds monosyllabic. Vibrations of reception and understanding. My story remains a mystery while his story is taught as history. His story built off the backs of black and brown bodies, the glory of Tories and their chants, drown out the sounds of our humanizing stories. These are unionizing tells. Do you only empathize when it sells? I hear what you're saying, G. No, no, honestly, that makes sense to me. We're not time managers, we're time engineers. Engineer that ish correctly. I shed private tears for peers I've never met nor will I forget. How long will we choose to be profit and property over people and our prosperity? I used to want to be equal, now I want equity. Reparations, not just for slaves, but for our whole black transatlantic nation. Thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs> um, Yes, 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 yes. So you might, you might be able to tell there's a lot going on in that little piece of ours. Um, and I feel like we just have to unpick how yes, we got there yes, and, and why sure. it runs like for that. For sure, for sure, yeah. Um, where to start? Where to start? I mean, so really where it did begin for us was that initial workshop yes. where we met, uh, I think it was somewhere not far from here. It was the level below um, us where yes. Tate Exchange used to be, if yes. anybody knows. Yeah, so we met there yes. and um, all came together. This is when we first were able to look through Liz's work. And, um, and meet Liz. And meet Liz. Importantly. Importantly. And um, something that was so special was that we were able to actually feel the mm. photos and look up look at them up close because so often with works that you see uh, in museums in galleries is up on a wall behind some glass there's there's a level of distance but with this we were able to literally touch it yeah. and at certain points even close our eyes so even though we were working with these photos sometimes we weren't relying on the sense of that visual thing which you would usually with a photo we were feeling a photo mm. and then seeing what that provoked in us yes and so yeah it really kind of started from there yeah and i think um with with the tactile nature of it all as well <laughs> sorry <laughs> with the um with the tactile nature of it all as well i think it started to remind us all of the time and the process that goes into 
actually creating work um, in analog mediums, whether that's like even the process behind Liz actually making the photographs, not just going out and taking the photos, but also developing the film, uh, printing them or scanning them just so we can actually see them. You know, there's a whole process and, and that really drove us to this notion of time. Um, and that became a really guiding um, theme? Yes, for sure. Right? For sure. Because we were already kind of offered that with, mm. you know, we knew that we were working with um, this sp specific um, order of her work, which had been named Time Don't Run Here. Yeah. Um, but having that experience kind of, yeah, yeah emphasizing. Feeling that yeah, experience. Yeah, feeling that experience. And we're very tactile people. Yeah. We so love to touch. Yeah, and also as well, I think a lot of... Um, I think the reason it's so all over the place as well is because it is we were able to experience an archive over yes. years. Yes. And um, so Liz's work is a lot about uh, the people and capturing people. So with that, there came many different moments that were captured in front of us. And um, a lot of the time, it'd be like those in-between moments, yeah. um, which also made me think of time. Yes. And uh, so a lot of what I drew from was the personal. So those photos of people just on the street, just on Peckham High Street, going about their day, on the phone, speaking to someone, mm. because really the personal is why we fight for the political. Mm. Um, if it wasn't for those, those lives that we live, what would we be fighting for? We're fighting for those moments in between. We're fighting for those moments that aren't necessarily that important, but they are, because they're, you know, they're all part of it. Yeah. So a lot of what I drew from was that personal experience. And um, at the time I was working at Theatre Peckham as well, um, who this project was also in collaboration with. And um, I was going to Peckham a lot of the time where Liz took a lot of her photos. And so, so much of the, what I was drawing from was from just my real lived experience of being in those places as well. Um, yeah, and then I think with you it was a bit different. Yeah, I was going to say, um, whereas what really stuck out to me was in so many of Liz's photos, particularly um, when she was choosing to document Black Lives Matter and the movement and the people, I was really struck uh, by, by the text, by the copy, by the signage, by the things people were holding up, the, the statements that kind of like travel across time. Um, you know, photographs don't carry sound. And yet I could hear their spirits so clearly and that really stuck out with me. Um, and so it, it kind of became this driving political call to action for me, right? I, I, I started to just collect words and piece them together and looking more and more into um, the archive uh, of Liz's work, but also just more generally the archive around that time, looking at lots of publications in print um, and digitally online, um, YouTube videos, interviews with people at protests. I, I really just started to get a lot of um, these political outcries, these really short, snappy statements that I felt were addressing quite a lot with quite a little. Um, and, and so without even realizing it, I was beginning to kind of like thread together what eventually became m my poem, right? Um, uh, and, and this is something we kind of did between ourselves over like weeks. You know, we came in, we had the workshop. Mm. Um, it was really fun. It was really open. Yes. It was really honest. It was really raw. Definitely. Um, yeah. And then, and then we had time to ourselves. Yes. Right. And yeah. we, and we had time to explore and and think and question mm. and and not think like and times when think, you're just thinking just about be. something else because that's the fun thing about being a poet. Um, you know, you can just say anything's your work because you're like, well, I'm just taking in life. Like, I'm going to put it back into my work. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't expose us. No, but it's real because it does. Because, you know, sometimes when you take that walk and you're not worried about things, you're taking in more things that you can put back in. So it's still, you know, I'm going to go with that because that makes me feel better. No, but, facts. you know, so... But it's a work. 
It does, it works. <laughs> and yeah, I think that was a big thing as well. We did literally have time. There was no time pressure. Mm. That, well, there was a time, yeah, but it wasn't a pressure. Was pressure. Yeah, yeah, and so we had that time to just be and to sit and to muse and to think, yeah. okay, and, and to ha take in different experiences. Yeah. And, um, and, and eventually that, that process independently uh, led us to time spent together yes. at Theatre Peckham, yes. sharing our ideas, sharing our work, and just kind of thinking as well, like how could this, what we've written, mm. you know, in our bedrooms or on mm. walks or whatever, like how can this actually exist in a museum? Like what would it look like when yeah. we bring it to life? Yes. Knowing that it's gonna surround Liz's work as well, yes. right? Yes, yes. Um, Cause I don't know if anyone has been in that section yet, but it's- Le um, Level two? Level two, if you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, there's a, a glass screen in the middle with the photos from the 2020 protests in London. And then around it is uh, different photos from the archive, so from all different times, um, different settings, parties. So there's a bit in it where I'm talking about, you know, the come down and like that comes from there and that thing again of taking it back to the personal. Um, but also, there was one other thing you said, um, just to backtrack about that thing of like the, the drive, like what is that drive? And I think that was something I really noticed with, with our focus on time, because even though it was, okay, what is time? What does it mean to take time? What does it mean to push time? Um, it's also that thing of what like kind of stands the test of time, like what is, always there. So we've had different protests and movements happen in many different ways and times, but what's the same undercurrent that's always there? That doesn't change. The times change, the people who are doing it changes, but the reason we're doing it, the drive, that's what stays the same. And yeah, so I just basically, I hear you. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and the drive, <laughs> the drive that has stayed the same is oppression. Right? And our need for equity, not just yeah. equality. Yeah. And we need that because these are real lives, mm. as, as you so beautifully illustrate for us. Mm. Um, we have 10 minutes left. I'm going to open up the floor to a Q&A. Is there anyone with a question in this space today? Didn't mean for that to rhyme, it just kind of happens. Ooh. Are you a poet also, or something? I know, right? If there's no questions as well, I will happily chat to yeah, Imogen we'll just keep up talking. here for like another so 10 don't minutes. Worry. Oh, we've got one hand at the back. Oh my hey. God, hey. Hey, Conrad. Wait. <laughs> Hello. No, wait, we know this guy. Yes, you do. Yes. Hi, it's me, Conrad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when you're collaborating on a piece of poetry and you know, your co-worker kind of has like a different vibe or something like that, or you know, you just, you misaligned with your objectives. How do you broach that? Thank you. So, what, as different? As, as different individuals. Do, do you know, um, I wanna say, I don't know if we ran into that as, as an issue, comrade, um, mm. but Imogen and I are very open, like, with each other, like we're actually friends. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. we actually talk. Um, we have an air of transparency, and I think with that comes a certain creative openness, mm. um, meaning we can share very freely. Mm. Um, I would never, and I and I hope this is a mutual feeling, but I would never hesitate to tell you, like, nah, babe, that ain't it. Yeah, and I'd want you to, because someone has to. Right? Yeah. And, and I would like to believe yeah. that if I'm writing something and it's yeah. trash, yeah. you're going to be like, jam. Yeah. I mean, maybe say it in a nice way, but... On a good day. I'd still say it, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, heard, I heard my parents laugh, and yeah. they, they know I could be a bit... <laughs> no, because sometimes you just, sometimes there's no time <laughs> yeah. for the niceties. Sometimes you you've got, you know, the poem needs to be written. Sure, Come I mean, on. Yeah. But... Yeah, it's true though. I guess um, we didn't necessarily run into that. Cause sorry, was the question like 
Like, how do you how actually navigate that, though? Because if, if someone, there's a clash. Yeah, but and, and you aren't aligned with the same objectives. Mm. I, I really think the answer is just talk. Yeah, ooh, yeah. And I suppose then also that can become a part of it. Like, maybe you don't align and that's part of the conversation because that's still, yeah, that adds to it. It's, it's a dimension to it that there's tension and it's like, cool, well, let's address the tension yeah. in it or, you know, behind the scenes, but then yes. bring but that yeah. fact that we've addressed it to it. Yeah. Um, and that adds uh, a whole other texture, mm. right? That adds a whole other... Um, material to mm. play with in mm. the work itself. Yeah. So I feel like it's For like, sure. don't shy away yeah, from you that, can't, right? Uh, I, I would say you can't, um, yeah, you can't like just be like, oh, no, it, no, no. Like, <laughs> We're not aligned, yeah. no. <laughs> like, it's just like, okay, like, not to say that, unless obviously you have to work with them, then if it's a choice, then maybe, maybe just don't. <laughs> but, um, Sometimes you have to work with people that you don't align with. And I think, yeah, not shying away from it, um, but accepting it for what it is and then working with it. Um, because if you're kind of working against yourself, then, you know, that's yeah. just a lot of effort yeah. on yourself yeah. as well. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, oh. Sorry, how do you end up uh, choosing to do poetry as a two of you rather than just working on your own? Because obviously most people think of poetry as a solitary thing, I mm. think. Um, so yeah, I was just curious about that. Yeah, yeah, we didn't actually talk about that actually. And um, when we were approached about the project um, by Theatre Peckham, they, we were both working there and we were just in the office at the same time and we found out about it and we were on board with it and because we were given the freedom to do to respond how we wanted we were told you know it, it can be separate or it can be together and then i'm not i don't remember when I, we decided I, I remember um imogen was like um imogen was like uh i've only ever imagined this as being separate like our pieces and I was like I've only ever imagined it, it as together, together. Yeah. Um, which was really funny that we both kind of came at it from those different entry yeah. points yeah. but once we had actually created the work once once it was actually written um, we we got to a point where we we kind of started to notice that it could actually exist in dialogue with each other there's a bit of an A and a B like y one piece is really kind of talking about this overarching societal themes and another is talking about this very like experiential personal um and and those aren't separate things you know e as as ideas as ideals they aren't separate they exist together yeah. um so i think it just kind of came out as the the natural conclusion mm -hmm. for the actual work um because like one, one thing Imogen and I consistently share in, in all of the work we do together is that we care first and foremost about the work and what we're putting out into the world. Um, so I think it was mm. like a very natural mm. kind of conclusion to be like, oh my God, like there's yeah. something happening here. Less, and do you know what? There is something lovely about doing something with someone. So even just being able to relax into that and then enjoy the process even more than knowing like okay we're in this together we could even then lean into it more when we realized that was something we could do it was like yeah let's definitely do that because we can literally lean on each other yeah. might as well yeah so um yeah but definitely a natural kind of thing yeah. yeah we have time for one more question and then we wrap our discussion for the evening is there any final questions or do we say an early goodbye Goodbye it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys.